This is part one in a series of videos that I'm making uh, where I give practical advice on how to succeed in physics and IV physics and maybe life in general. This first part is very practical aspects of what to do when you sit the exam and specifically what sort of things you should do to prepare for sitting for the exam. Let's get into the really practical stuff now. What should we do on paper one, the multiple choice exam? I think these are things that you'd have to be crazy not to do. Nevertheless, most students don't do them. My first bit of advice would be to write in the exam booklet. In particular, make a diagram for the problem. Annotate that diagram with your variables, with the information that you're given. You need to sort out that information and get very, very clear about what the question is asking. Funny thing happens when you're clear about what's being asked, you're usually able to solve the problem. Make sure you cross out answers that you realize are wrong along the way. Later on, I'm going to show you some techniques for eliminating answers, uh, and we'll look at that in more detail. Put a personalized marker beside any question that you haven't answered or you're unsure of, any question that you want to return to. If you're stuck, move on. Don't spend too much time on any one question. Work with pace, yet work calmly. And what you're doing with all the above steps is you're preparing yourself for a second pass. So you've written all this information in the exam booklet. So it will be easy for you to pick up where you were when you left off. You've also marked all the questions that you need to return to. So that's going to speed things up. The other big advantage about the second pass is that you're giving your subconscious mind a little bit of time to process that information. And typically when you come back to the question, it's with fresh eyes. And a lot of the ideas that would not have settled for you originally will now have settled. So things will become clearer for you and you'll be much more likely to be able to solve the problem. And that second pass, it doesn't have to be the last one. You can do a third pass as well, fourth pass, whatever you need. During the final five minutes, you'll be given a warning that there's only five minutes left. Uh, and then during that final minute, you want to do your guessing. Leave your guessing to the, the final minute. Make sure you answer all the questions because there's no penalty for wrong answers. For those multiple choice questions where you don't quite know the physics, there are some strategies you can use to eliminate some of the answers. So probably five or six questions on every exam are these answer pair questions, or what I like to call answer pair questions. So they always have two columns, one and two. And you need an answer for each column. And there's always a pair of answers in each column. If you know one of these answers is not correct, so for instance, you know Kelvin is not correct, that allows you to eliminate two choices. And so for this question, you're either going to guess A or B. This next one, I've cut off most of the question because we're not going to use much physics to do it. We're just going to use some logic. In this case here, our strategy is going to be look for a part of the answer that occurs in most of the choices, but not all of the choices. We've got a bunch of choices down here. And you'll notice that the S is in the first three choices, but not in the fourth one. So we should be able to eliminate that fourth choice. D would not be correct. We can take this a little bit farther if we think about the units in the questions. The units need to be consistent. So we're looking for a specific heat capacity, and you probably know that that's equal to an energy divided by a mass times a change in temperature. When you look at these answers here, you'll notice that all of them have this G in the top. So can you think of an equation for energy that involves G? And you probably can. You could use MGH as an energy equation. That would mean that you're expecting masses to cancel out. So you'd like to eliminate choices where there is an M appearing. So you would eliminate this one and I guess we'd double eliminate this one, and we'd have it reduced down to B and C. Now the S and the N 
those are the number of things. So quantities that are the number of something are unitless. So they're not going to have any effect on the units. Now, in this particular problem, we might realize that it has to do with the total mass of the pellets here, which would equal the number of pellets times the mass per pellet. And that would be an M in the top and the bottom. So we're not expecting any Ns as well. So this answer would be wrong, and we would choose answer B. Here's a question. Pause the video, read the question over, and try to do the question without using any equations, just using some reasoning. So the first thing you might consider is any directional changes. So I can see right here that P is bigger than Q. And especially since the pressures are the same, I'm expecting more mass to be in P. So I'm expecting this ratio to be bigger than one, and for that reason, I would eliminate choices A and B. I would then consider the factors that I'm given. I'm given a 200, which is a factor really of two. I'm giving a, given a 400, a factor of four, and I'm given a twice, which is a factor of two. Now, if I multiply all those together, I get 16. If I multiply the two and the four and then divide by the two, I'll get eight divided by two is four. Or if I uh, multiply the two twos together and divide by four, I'd get one. So this was two times four over two. This was multiplying them. And this was two times two divided by four. And you'll notice here that there's really no way of getting an eight if I multiply or divide the two, the four, and the two. And for that reason, I would eliminate the eight here and I'd choose answer C. Now, make sure you only do this type of reasoning as a last resort or as something to supplement your ideas. By and large, the IB does a pretty good job of setting up questions so that you can't do this type of thing. Two things that you need to watch out for on physics questions would be key phrases and red herrings. Pause the video, try this question, and then come back. Now the key phrase in this question here is constant speed. Constant speed or constant velocity is actually the most common of these key phrases. A few of the others would include magnitude, uh, resultant force, elastic as in elastic or inelastic collision. These are all key phrases that if you don't notice them, you'll probably get the question wrong. Now because it is at constant speed, that means that there's no change in kinetic energy. And that implies that all the loss of the gravitational potential energy is going to go into thermal energy. So the correct answer has to be just MGH. So this coefficient of friction mu here and this distance x here, they're given in the problem, as variables at least, but we don't use them. So when they give us extra information that we don't need, we call that a red herring. It's just something that sometimes comes up and you need to be aware of it. When you're doing your practice questions, in particular the IB style practice questions, make sure that you're classifying the questions that you're doing, in particular the multiple choice questions. And what I mean by that is there's usually an underlying idea that keep reappearing year after year after year. And so you want to become flexible and robust in your understanding of that underlying idea and to see it in many different situations. So some of the common underlying ideas would be, say, Newton's first law. Whenever you see the phrase that the velocity is constant, then you know the net force is zero and vice versa. Uh, the idea of a magnitude, whether it be of displacement or of velocity or of acceleration or whatever, comes up a lot. The idea that all horizontal projectiles that are at the same height are going to reach the ground at exactly the same time. The idea that 
when objects bounce, there's a bigger change in momentum, a bigger impulse than if they just come to a stop. The idea that the acceleration of a projectile is negative 9.8 downwards on the way up, on the way down, and at the top, the same all the time. The idea that slope equals value, so if you have an xt curve and a vt curve, the slope of the xt curve will equal the value of the vt curve. If you've got a product such as impulse equals force times time, and you do a graph of force times time, so force times time is that product, then the area under that force time curve is going to equal the impulse here. And we do that with other quantities as well. Change in velocity equals acceleration times time, etc. So this idea comes up a lot. Uh, what affects the speed of a wave? So we have to do something to the medium of the wave to change the speed, because if we go to a higher frequency, we get a smaller wavelength, etc. And you'll see a lot of questions of this type where you're asked for some sort of ratio, in particular a ratio where there's a before quantity and an after quantity. What's the ratio of the kinetic energy before to the kinetic energy afterwards? And there's a fairly common approach that you should take to those types of problems. So you're going to become much more flexible, much more robust in your understanding if you're illicit about classifying the questions that you're doing. My advice for paper two, well, paper two has a five minute reading time and you want to take that to advantage. It gives you a little chance to digest the task at hand. So just glance through the paper and take it all in. Use the same strategy as paper one using markers and multiple passes through the exam. In particular, you want to do the easy questions first because that's going to build confidence. That's going to kind of settle the nerves down. Get over those initial shakes. The aim is to work calmly but with pace. Nice, even pace. Sort the information in the questions. Get clear about what's being asked. If you're clear about what's being asked, you're more likely to solve the problem. A lot of the written answers that I read, they look like a journal entry where a person's seeking an answer and they just keep kind of writing and writing hoping that they land on a good idea. What you really want to do is on a rough sheet of paper plan out that answer. You don't have to write it word for word but plan out the key points that you want to make and make sure if it's a three-point question that you have at least three points. And this is very important. Sometimes students will get kind of excited because they see a question that they know they've done something like it before and they end up doing terrible on it because they answer the question that they had before rather than adjusting to the new information of this particular question. So answer the question that's in front of you and not the question that you did a month ago. Now there's a real tendency with the pressure of the exam and that time constraint that you get into this mindset where you're just kind of regurgitating information. And of course, what you really need to be able to do is to make observations and uh, to do some thinking. The way to get yourself out of this mode is, well, you've got to practice before the exam. You've got to put yourself into some situations that are exam-like. It doesn't need to be anything sophisticated. Just say, give yourself 10 minutes to do an IB question. See how you make out. But that's going to build some comfort and some familiarity with the time constraint that you're going to face in the future. So you want to practice just getting familiar and comfortable with this pressure that lies in the future. My advice for paper three is almost identical to my advice for paper two. The key difference here, of course, is that that paper three is on the next day and it's a limited content. Uh, you're going to get a data analysis question and an option question. And it tends to be high rewards if you understand this material well. Don't put too much emphasis on studying the day before. You'll be able to put a few hours in, but you're going to be tired after your paper two. You want to get a good sleep, so you're fresh for paper three. So don't do cramming that day between the paper two and the paper three. And my advice here, 
would be to watch my video on becoming skillful with data analysis questions. There's some a lot of questions that come up over and over and over again and you can prepare yourself for them. 40 marks for this paper so it's really worth putting your time into this content. So please take the time to like videos, to make comments, to ask questions, become a subscriber, sign up for notifications, become a member or a Patreon. And that's all for today, folks. Thank you very much.